We're going to continue our study in Hebrews 6. And uh, when you get there, just give me a good amen. Hebrews 6. And, uh, and we're going to continue our... We, we've been preaching the last two Sundays on the Sunday mornings. We were preaching on the six foundations of Christianity. And I really felt to go this way. I'm not just preaching this to fill in time. There's a lot I want to preach. There's a lot of sermons that sound better, maybe. But uh, this is doctrinal. This is needful. This is something all of us must understand. Without a foundation, you will never grow. You have to have our foundation. And not only individually, but corporately. We've got to have this. And so that's, what I've ta- that's why I've taken this time to touch on this. And I've came out of Hebrews chapter 6, starting in uh, verse 1. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2, which we've been laying. We've been using that as our text. And this is what it says. Hebrews chapter 6. In verse one, it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God of the doctrine of baptisms and on the and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. If you remember the very first Sunday I preached this, I went over the foundations of faith towards God and I went over the foundations of repentance. And then last Sunday, I went over the doctrine of baptisms and the doctrine of laying on of hands. And this Sunday, we're going to tie this to tie this up and I'm going to try to just try to over uh, just very briefly, just try to go over this. We can't go in depth or we would spend weeks on this, but we're going to talk about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. The resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. When we look at this in the Bible, we know that resurrection is something that, that really is popular in Christianity. A lot of times we talk about that. But if you remember on Easter morning, I preached a message directly on the resurrection. And I spent some time there talking about what if Christ did not rise. And I talked about the repercussions if there was no resurrection. Now, dealing with this today on the doctrine of the resurrection, we're going to look at this from this perspective and just try to briefly go over it. But when we look at the resurrection throughout the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, we will find that the resurrection from the Latin word, and I can't pronounce it the best, but it's a Latin word there, but it simply means rising again, a return to life after having you have died. Mainly refers to the resurrection of Christ and for those that are in Christ that will be resurrected. And this is pivotal. This is that Christian faith hinges on this fact that One day, if you die in this world, you are going to get up again if you are in Jesus Christ. The promise of the resurrection is going to be there for you. I find that so encouraging. I don't know about you. I would be terrified to think today that if I died, like the Jehovah's Witness teach, that if you die, life is like a candle that just goes out. And there you are are in the grave. And there you just have to hope that one day you're going to come out of that grave and we're going to come here and live on this world. But you have this promise today, that if you die before that rapture, you're going, if you're in Christ, if you're born again, you have that guarantee you're going to get up from that grave. That is encouraging. The grave has no victory over you. It cannot conquer you. So when we look at this today, we'll find that the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to the New Testament and the foundation of the theology of the church. These events have been acknowledged as the paramount from the early church to the present. The resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I told, I, I preached to you on Easter morning that Paul told us and Paul argues that if Jesus did not get up from that grave as the first fruit of the believers, that everything that our biblical faith is, is fallacy, it is ineffective. He tells us that preaching would be useless. He was letting us know that the apostolic witness would, would be false. Sin would be remained forgiven. That believers would die without hope. He also tells us that Christians would be misguided and to another the doctrine. He was letting us know there that without the resurrection everything that we believe in this Bible would not hold together. It all ties together. There's many things that are pivotal in Christianity, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead is something that is essential for you to live and be victorious as a believer. You have that blessed hope. I don't know about you today. What made Paul say to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. He wasn't telling us he was 
worried about getting thrown in a tomb somewhere. He wasn't worried about getting buried somewhere and just having to be captivated there or having to go dwell in the lower parts of the world. He was letting us know that in Christ that we get to get up again after we die. That is just so wonderful and glorious. Now, when we look at the resurrection throughout the Bible, we must attack it or come from it from the perspective starting at the Old Testament. And we would know that the Old Testament, even though there's many references in the Old Testament to decay of death, the depths of the grave, Sheol, Hades, as the pit of destruction, you can read through either the Old Testament, and there's many references. You can chain reference it all day. I could give you more references you can read in a week here. Talking about the grave in the Old Testament, but you would find in the Old Testament, they still had hope. They didn't fully understand that hope, even though they only had a partial glimpse at it, but they still had hope that this, they really didn't understand it all. But when you read in the Old Testament, you would find the circumstances when it surrounded death, there were still those that were Jewish, those that knew Yahweh, those that knew of God, they still had that underlying hope in their life that they were going to live again. Even though they didn't need to look at it from the New Testament perspective, I mean, we're blessed. We get to look at things on this side of or this side of the Bible, when back then all they had there to take the words, what was read in the synagogues, you know, what was spoken to the prophets, and there. But we are blessed today, because not only are we given commandments, but those commend, commandments, as we heard about this morning in Sunday school, they're written on our heart. They are in the inward parts. And not only do we hear about this resurrection, but we get to experience this resurrection. We understand when you look at the language of the Old Testament writers, death was a such a great mystery to them. They awaited, they didn't really know what awaited on the other side. They knew that if they would be with Yahweh, they would live again. But everything was different. They still had uncertainty about what was going to happen, what everything was going to be like. They just knew one day you could find references throughout Scripture for a deeper study for another time. You would find men like David when he lost his little boy. He said something like this. He said, I, he, he cannot come to me, but I can go to him. He was referring to somewhere else after this life. You could read that many different references. There's somewhere else after this life. And that is the Old Testament perspective. But the New Testament develops what the Old Testament emphasizes on that there is a living God as a sovereign of life. But in the New Testament, it's not focused and on Yahweh as maybe there's something going on on the other side of life, on the other side of death. But in the New Testament, the focus goes from this uh, just maybe a mystery to knowing that we're going to live. And all of a sudden, the focus goes on Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And it, it's a transition here that the Savior's life is the very life that we can overcome through. It's not being good enough. It's not being strong enough. Your good deeds ain't going to get you resurrected. Your good deeds won't get you to heaven. Your good deeds only get you so far. But the only way you're going to go in that resurrection, you could build a hundred hospitals, it's not going to get you there. You could build a million schools on the foreign field, it's not going to get you there. You could give enough money to feed the needy, it's not going to get you there. But we must be in Christ because He is the resurrection. He tells us there in the Bible, we can read so many different things about the Son of God, but Jesus Christ incarnate in the New Testament, He is the picture picture of the resurrection and what you and I are to follow by. Given that universal reality of the death of Jesus and the death of every individual in here, it's not going to change. Look, if you go in the rapture, that, that would be a wonderful thing. But if Jesus does not come back today, every one of you in this room, you've got an appointment with Mr. Death. You're going to meet him, be it through sickness, be it through tragedy, be it through something else that takes you out of this world. It does not change the fact today that everybody apart from that rapture, all of us are going to die. You say, well, what happened to Enoch and Elijah? Well, don't put all your money on that. Yes, that happened to them, but he's already got enough witnesses. He don't need you to be there too. We must understand. We're going to live this. We are all going to die. One of us one day, if it doesn't, how it happens is different from everybody, but all of us here today has an appointment with death apart from that rapture. So we look at this and we must understand that it's through Jesus, and as Jesus declares in 11 and 25, he says, I am the resurrection of the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. We know that. That in Christ, if you die in him, we are going to live again. Even in the life of Jesus. Hear me today. There was something about Jesus' life. He showed a certain authority over death, unlike any other prophet. Even though you've seen miracles in the Old Testament where somebody was resurrected to life, there was something about the disposition of Christ. There was something
something about the authority in his life. He approached death from a completely different angle. He wasn't afraid of it. He walked to the cross. Nobody made him go there. He did it willingly because he knew that on the other side of that, he was going to fulfill the Old Testament. He was going to fulfill the will of the Father. And there he was going to make a way for you and I to go into the heavens just like he spoke to that thief on the cross. He said, today you shall be with me in paradise. We know that there he made that way. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we must understand this. Now, the life of Jesus. The New Testament also provides many examples of people being miraculously returned to life. We have Jerry, Jerry's daughter there. And I may pronounce that wrong. Somebody told me, but it's all good and well. I ain't the best at pronouncing these names sometimes. Then there was the young man at Nain. We know the mother there. Jesus came there. It was a funeral procession. Jesus touched the coffin there, the casket, the briar, but whatever, how you would pronounce that. And there that man came to life. Jesus told him to arise. But then we have the famous story of Lazarus, the witness in John. We know that Lazarus there, he was dead. He was in that tomb. Then we have it three to four days. And everybody thought was Jesus was late. But we know Jesus was right on time. Again, it's amazing that Jesus can get here any time and it's the right time. Jesus can get here three days late and it's still on time. Jesus may not answer your prayer for another five years, but it's on time. Because He knows the witness behind it. He knows the desired testimony behind it. He knows what He's trying to do with that situation. It doesn't matter when God answers it. When He answers it, it's for a reason and it's always on time in the will of God. Jesus' authority over Lazarus' death is probably not apart from His own. It's the greatest witness to you and I because it won't like it. He had just died. I mean, it was four days later and they said, Behold, He stink. If they knew He was in that sepulcher, that tomb there, and they knew that He was dead. They knew that in four days, I mean, you just can picture Martha and Mary there. I mean, four days later when Jesus came, we won't get fully into that story, but we know that when Jesus came there, that we know that Jesus wept over it because He knew He was the resurrection. And that's when He reminded them. He says, I am the resurrection. And then when He calls Lazarus forth, Lazarus came out of that grave and it was such an influential testimony that the very Sadducees and Pharisees wanted to assassinate Lazarus because there was no denying who He was that He died and that He got up again. Well, they didn't assassinate Lazarus. So they go after Jesus, amen. And they're still trying to assassinate Him. Because that testimony is sure that Jesus got up out of that grave. You say, Brother Derek, I don't know about that. Why don't we have a tomb where Jesus was? Or why don't we have a piece of clothing that Jesus wore? Or Jesus wore at that time. Why don't we have His grave clothes or something because of this? Because dead people don't need a tomb. Jesus is not dead, so why does He need grave clothes? Jesus is not dead, so why does He need a tomb? And if they did have it, they knew knew Jesus and God knew that if there was some, some sort of grave clothes or sepulcher somewhere, that somebody would end up worshiping that piece of clothing, and somebody would end up worshiping that sepulcher. I mean, the Catholics already built a church on everything they think Jesus stepped on. If they said Jesus preached a rock here, a rock here, they'll put a church on it. They said Jesus wept here, they'll build a church on it. They knew that men would worship that place more than they would worship Jesus, who is the resurrection. It was nothing to do with the clothing. It was nothing to do with the sepulcher. It was nothing to do with the rock in front of it. It it was to do with that man in there because he got up. The doctrine of the resurrection. Jesus got up. So you get to get up. North Carolina terms there. Jesus got up, so you've got the promise of getting up. I think I've told it here before, but just it's so well to me, it's just a childlike story that fits so well about those group of young men, the young boys who was in the backyard. And I don't know what you did when you were young. When I was a young boy, I played out in the yard. I didn't have, we didn't have all these different gadgets and gadgets at that time, and I'm still young, and I know that's in my lifetime. I had to go outside, and I had to drink out the water hose. I just, that was the way life was. I didn't go, get to go inside. Mom said, go to the spigot, son, get you something to drink. Tell your friends to drink out the hose. Nowadays they say you get sick from it or something. I don't know. But I do know this. That when I was younger, we would build forts. We would dig holes. We would do anything. We would play cops and robbers. We would chase butterflies. We would do whatever we had to to entertain ourselves. But there's a story about a group of young boys in a backyard. And they were digging a big tunnel. And one day they would they finally had dug this big tunnel. They worked on it for weeks at a time. And they dug this nice big tunnel there. And all of a sudden it came time that one of the boys said, who's going to be the first one to crawl through it? Well, none of the boys jumped up and said, here am I, send me. 
So, you know, there's always one of us that, that just always a boy that goes first. He's the one that usually breaks the bones. He's the one that usually gets in the gets in trouble. Amen. And everybody else just gets the away scot free. But this boy, one day he said to himself, he said, he told the rest of the boys, he said, I'll go first. And they looked out and they watched that little boy as he went in that tunnel across that yard. And they watched as he disappeared into that darkness. And they were so nervous. I mean, the adrenaline was rushing. It was a minute or so later. And all of a sudden they thought that maybe he had died. Maybe that tumble, that, that tunnel had collapsed on him. But all of a sudden at the other, other end of that tunnel there, they seen some dust begin to rattle, rattle a little bit. Dust begin to to come up and that little boy jumped out the other end of that tunnel raised both hands and said I made it and so the rest of the boys started going through the tunnel just like Jesus that day on that cross he died on Calvary he we disappeared into that darkness for those hours and everybody for those few days was looking at Jesus they didn't see no dust and time would pass by they didn't know if he made it they didn't know what to look for they didn't understand that he said but he came out of the grave he raised both hands so to speak and said I made it it's okay for you to come this way and we still have that comfort today that if you go the way of the cross if you go the way of Calvary, if you go the way of Christ, you get to come up on the other side of that thing, victorious, resurrected, you begin to put on the incorruptible, it doesn't matter what life may bring you, be it a sickness, be it a death, be it a tragedy, you can overcome that through the resurrection. That's why there's so much, hear me today, friend. We have to put emphasis on being absent in this body is being present with the Lord. Thank God for life. Thank God for friends. I love all of you. I love my wife. I couldn't, you know, in my mind, it just, I couldn't imagine having to pass on or her pass it on before me. But I know when that time comes, we are going to be able to make it. We are going to be able to survive it. Just like uh, in the story, if you ever read the, the biography of Corey Ten Boone before, we know that if you've never read a biography, read it. And she was a lady, her sister, and, they, and her father was a watchmaker. But they would help hiding Jews. The name of the book is The Hiding Place. They would help hiding Jews. They World War II there, and it's an amazing story. But the young girl, in the beginning of the book, and you can even hear the audio book, in the very beginning of that book, that little girl was talking to her daddy one night. He's sitting down beside her at bed there, and he's talking to her daddy, and she says, Daddy, what happens when we die? How can we make it? How can we How can we go through something so tragic? And that father, in his wisdom, looked back at little Corey Ten Boom and said to her, she, he said, Sweetie, when you're getting on a train, when when does the conductor give you your ticket? And she says, when you're about to get on the train. He said, the same thing with death. He says, you're going to get that ticket when you're about to get on it. He said, don't worry. Don't sit here and stress about it now. When the time comes, God's going to see you through it. God's going to take you through it. And those very words from her childhood help her survive concentration camps, help her survive death after death in her family because she understood that in Christ there came a golden ticket to get on board the ride of life, eternal life, where you'll never have to worry or fret about death again. Again, and that is the only posture that we have from Scripture. We're not to fear death, but we are to overcome it. Now, I know death has a... Now, I'm not here today acting super spiritual, saying I, I don't look at death and cringe at some thought of it. I couldn't imagine losing my wife or something like that. But just like D.L. Moody said, they said, do you think you could die a martyr? He said, no. But if the time came for it, God would give me the strength. And I believe that. It doesn't matter what you face. That apparent moment, the grace of God's going to be there. So we know that Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. He was the very first one. It was future hope for the believers. First Thessalonians 4 and 16. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Some say because they got six foot further to go. I don't know why. But they go first, and then those that are alive and remain will go behind them, go next. So we understand, we even find in 1 Corinthians, without going in this in depth, 1 Corinthians 15 and 52, and the moment in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall we be... Shall 
shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The death of Jesus. And there's many things we could talk about here. He went down to Sheol, the grave and hell, and He conquered death. They said, I like one preacher said, that when he walked out of hell, walked out of Sheol, it said he snatched sting out of death, and he took the victory out of grave, and he stood up victorious and resurrected. It was all through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hear me today, if you're a sinner here today, you do not have that hope. If you're a sinner here today, all that is waiting on you is death and damnation. That grave still has victory over you. You will live out death the rest of your life and eternity past. Let's move into this last principle because they tie together. When we look at this last principle, it not only does it give us the principle of the resurrection of the dead, but it goes into the sixth one I'm going to touch on, and it talks about eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. Hear me today. This is the last of the six principles, and it bears the weight of eternity. All of these principles leads to the final one that all of us here today, you're going to stand before God in the judgment. You say, Brother Derek, why? I know there's a lot of people, even today, that does not like to talk about that word and say it'll hurt somebody's self-esteem. It doesn't promote that mentality of feel good. But hear me today, the judgment of the believer and the unbeliever is going to happen if you and I like it or not. If I preach it or not, it's going to happen. We read throughout the Bible, why do we preach about judgment? I preach about judgment because it is a, it's prominent in Scripture and I am, a, I am accountable as a pastor and a teacher to unfold the whole counsel of God before you today. All of us are going to be judged. Don't try that stuff with Jesus. Judge not. I know that's popular nowadays. You may get away with it with the preacher, but you're not getting away with it with God. You ain't going to look at God on judgment day and say, Judge not, Lord. He's going to judge you. You're going to be judged, believer and unbeliever alike. That's why it says in the Bible, and whosoever shall receive you, nor hear your words when it's talking to the disciples, when you depart out of the house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. We as a church, we as a pastor, and us as the body of Christ, we are called to publish to this community that there's going to be a judgment on this world. There's going to be a judgment on every individual. And then the people that live up the road, there's going to be a judgment. The people that live beside me, they're going to be judged. The people that are in my family, they're going to be judged. Everybody will be judged. It doesn't matter who you are. Now, when we look at this, we must understand, God has already fixed that day in His mind. We don't have to sit here and try to name dates and times. It's going to happen. He has fixed that in his mind, Acts 17 and 31, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given an assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. We have that assurance. Everybody will be judged. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. It is appointed a man once to die, and then the judgment. And we must understand also when we preach about sin, about judgment here, it also combats sin in people's lives. Hear me today. Because the Bible tells us that for we he sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there are made at those sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Do you know the fact that there is a judgment is the very fact that keeps some people saved? Now it should be your love for Christ. And Lord, I hope you get there if you're not. But then again, I've got some people, the only reason they don't want to, they say, I don't want to die and go to hell. That's what drove me to the altar. They'll tell you that it was a certain fear of the judgment. There was something there that caused them to fear. They feared that judgment. Hear me today. Because we must understand that that judgment acts as a restrainer for some. We must understand that all of us are going to be judged. It's easy to get excited about the blessings. It's easy to get excited about salvation. It's easy to get excited about Pentecost. But when's the last time you got excited about being judged by Jesus? John Piper said this, and I just got it down here. He says, as I was preparing for a message one day on the judgment, 
He said, I was preparing for the judgment of the unbeliever and believer. As I was preparing for our worship service today, he said, I went through hymnals looking for a hymn that celebrated the glory of God's righteous judgment. He said, and I come to find that there was none. I could not find one. He said, that is a bad sign and a deficiency in theology and a stunted relationship with God. He said, all of us one day ought to joyfully look standing before our Savior and know that we've done something for Him, is what He's saying. We, all of us here, I understand what He's saying here today. He's talking about the fact that we're going to be judged one day. And all of us here, yes, there should be a certain reverence for it. If you're a sinner today, you ought to have the greatest fear in your life. You ought to run to this altar while I'm preaching if you're not saved. Because that judgment is going to be eternal for you. But understand this today, friend. That judgment also is going to be for believers. And we need to understand that we need to work for Him and police ourselves. That one day we get to stand before Him and know that we are able to make it. Through Christ. Now, what is the basis of this judgment? I found in Romans two and seven. This is what it says: To them who be, to them who by patient continuance and well doing seek for the glory and honor of immortality and eternal life. But he says in two and eight: But unto them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. He's letting us know for those that are in continuance with this gospel, for those that are in continuance with the things of God, there's going to be eternal life and there's going to be immortality. But then he says in the very next verse: For those that are contentious. So let me ask you today this simple question. Are you in continuance with the gospel? Or are you in contention with the gospel? Are you continuing? Are you with Paul today when he says, let us go on? Living a life of continuance, which means I am going forward. Or do we always, are we always individuals of contention? You know what contention means? Always strife. Always something wrong. The so and so in the next hour beside us just can't. It's just always contention. There's somebody I'm not saying here, but there's people, somebody's in the church world. You can't. It doesn't matter what you do. They're contentious. You need to be careful, because if you live with a contentious spirit long enough, it'll draw you away from Christ. And you'll lose your vision. You'll quit growing. And you'll get lukewarm, and you'll eventually backslide. All over being contentious. But as Paul said, let us be in continuance. Understand this today. All believers must continue. We must go on. There must be no retraction. We must not be somebody that just draws back. But we must be people that go on. We understand this today. That all of us here are going to be judged by the deeds that are in this body. If you're born again today, you're still going to be judged by your deeds. Now you say, well, Brother Derek, we're saved. What do you mean by that? Isn't it eternal security? Don't you just get saved one time and, man, the rest of your life is just a glass of lemonade in the sunshine, you know? But what about picking up your cross? That word continuance there to me, as I was studying this, it almost like just began to echo throughout my heart. Continuance has a lot to do with your salvation. I've never asked, and I don't believe Brother Glenn has ever asked anybody to be perfect overnight. Nobody's looked at you and said, look, you get saved today, tomorrow I want you to be that, that individual. If you can do it that quick and you let God work, it ain't God. If you let God work that quick, then good. But hear me, continuance has a lot to do with it. Are you continuing? Look from the day you got saved. Have you been going forward? Look from the day you got saved. Are you in the same place? <clears throat> Look from the day you got saved. And we must understand that continuance has a lot to do with it. You must continue in this gospel. And that's why all of us are going to be judged by the deeds in our body. We must understand that. You say, well, Brother Derry, that brings another question. If we're going to be, be judged by deeds, don't that make, that make us living by works? No, it doesn't. When you get saved, what I'm trying to get you to understand is when you get saved, you're going to be judged by the fruit that you bear. There ought to be a change in your life. There ought to be deeds in your life. But the heart that is full of faith and born again will overflow with attitudes and actions that are very different from those that are, from, that are unbelievers. Therefore, our deeds will testify truly of the genuineness or the absence of faith in our life. What I'm trying to say to you today, I can look at the deeds in your life and I can tell if you're born again or not. 
I've said it before. You don't buy bananas without judging fruit. If it's bruised up, you don't buy it. Bad banana, good banana. You vote for elections. Good president, bad president. Bad president. That's judgment. You make judgments every day. Make a left to go home or make a right to go that way. Turn in the driveway or don't turn in the driveway. If you're going to make it home, when you leave here today, you're going to have to make decisions where to turn. Same thing in salvation. You're going to have to make decisions and there's going to have to be continuance in your life. That does not mean you over, that does not mean you win salvation through deeds. When you get born again, the deeds testify of who you are. Deeds do not earn salvation, but they exhibit salvation. Deeds do not earn salvation. Deeds exhibit salvation. I can look at your, your deeds and you are a display. I'm a Christian or I'm not a Christian. You understand? You say, well, Brother Derek, what about somebody that gets saved today? What if their deeds tomorrow ain't perfect? But you still look for the deeds that are good. You're going to look for something to change somewhere. Somewhere there's going to be a change, and then you'll see that progressively work in their life. So look into this today. We judge a tree by the fruit it bears. We judge a Christian by the language. We can judge by attire, their company they keep, the life they live. We can judge if somebody's continuing in Christ or not. Everybody, I know you can't always judge a book by its cover, but you can judge an individual by their deeds. You can. That is a fact. Now, looking at this today, this is where the fork in the road comes. If you're, when we're talking about eternal judgment today, this is a fact. You're either going to have eternal life after this life, or there's going to be God's wrath and fury and damnation. The old saying is, heaven or hell, you must choose. Choose. When we look in the Bible, when it comes to the judgment of unbelievers, it lets us know, it gives us a glimpse of it in Revelation 20 and 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth, the from face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave of the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were, and, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It was letting us know one day, if you're not saved today, there's going to be a great white throne judgment for you. It says even the seed's going to, seed's going to give up the dead. There's going to be a judgment one day for the unbeliever. And not only that, do you know if you're a sinner today, the judgment of God is already revealed. There's many things that will take place in your life that is the judgment of God where we've departed from Him. It also says, us know in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. To me, that's probably the worst thing. You're going to be cast into a place where the presence of the Lord is not even there. You understand it now? I just feel this in my heart. Just imagine, everybody hear me. Imagine for a moment not being able to have access to the mercy and the grace of God at all. Even if you're a sinner here today, you have some access in some form. There's somewhere in your life the mercy of God is there. There's somewhere in your life that God's hand is upon you. Years ago when I heard a lady tell a story about mercy, she had a vision one time of mercy, and I didn't know her directly, but this is how it was told. One day this lady, she was praying, and she said, God, get, she was fasting and praying. She said, God, give me a vision of what mercy really is. She says, and all of a sudden in her spirit, the Lord showed her a vision. She said it was a vision of Jesus And she told the Lord, that's your mercy. You just standing there. And God spoke to her one more time and said, look closer. And she said in her spirit, the Lord told her to look closer. And she looked closer and behind Jesus, which seemed to be the most gruesome looking demons, seemed to be the most tragic looking stuff that was behind them. And Jesus was standing there 
And he was keeping all of that at bay. He was keeping all of that back. But when the judgment of the unbeliever comes, the mercy, the restrainer, he's going to be pulled out of the way. And everything the devil desires to do with you is going to happen in your life. That's what the eternal damnation is. And God's presence cannot reach you there. Never. It's amazing. Judgment has very little touch on many hearts. Not everybody. But the word judgment has very little touch on hearts. It's real. And every sinner will stand before Him. We'll never feel His presence again. We'll preach on hell another time. But we're preaching on this today. I want to encourage the believers today. I want you to understand the judgment of the believers also will take place. All Christians today, if you're here today and you're born again, you're going to stand before Christ. Everyone that is in this room, all Christians will be subject to judgment. There will be no exceptions. You understand here today, the judgment will most likely occur. Different ideas, different times, in different people's minds. But most likely, to my understanding, it will probably occur after the rapture of the church. There's different opinions on that. Or when Christ comes through His church. But the judgment of Christians is something solemn and serious. Especially since there's a possibility of believers losing or are losing things in that. It says here, we'll read in 1 Corinthians 3, it says now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We refer to this as believers, believers as judgment of the believers. The time, place, and take the week. We could argue over time all day. We don't know. Well, I have my ideas about it. But the fact is today, you're going to be judged. And Paul asked the question, how are you building on the foundation? As a believer today, everybody must take inventory in your life. How are you building today on this foundation? He asked us, are you building here? Are you building with gold, silver, and precious stones? Are you building with things that are precious? Or are you building on this foundation? Or are you building with wood, hay, or stubble? He said, because every man's work shall be manifest, and it will be revealed by fire. Now, it doesn't take a brain scientist to figure this out. When gold, silver, and precious stones are burnt, it refines them. But when wood, hay, and stubble is burnt, it becomes ashes. And I dare say, and I believe there's enough confirmation in the Bible... There's some people that on Judgment Day that even though they're saved, and even though they're going to make it to heaven, they're going to be standing in a big ash heap. They're going to be standing in ashes. I don't know what would be more tragic to me. I know you say in heaven there's going to be perfect. I know that. I know there's not going to be no tears. But I would be upset at myself individually. I would cringe to think of the fact that I got to heaven where or I'm standing before Jesus one day. And Jesus says, look, even though you're on the right foundation, even though you're on the right foundation, you did nothing but build with the wrong material. You wasted your life. You could have done more. And even though there's no condemnation in Christ, Look today, I want to show you your error. Think about that. Imagine somebody being in a false doctrine their whole life. And going to hell, looking back and saying, I died, I lived and breathed for that. And it was wrong. But imagine as a being a believer, standing for Christ. And Christ looks back at you and says, your perspective was wrong. I had tried to speak to you through preaching. Yes, you got, yes, you got saved, but you never continued. Yes, you understand. Yes, you took certain parts of the Bible, but you, oh, you never continued. You went about your way. You lived your life for yourself. You never continued to the furtherance. You never continued to the sanctification, the feeling, the gifts of the Spirit, the evangelizing of your community. And there many people are condemned and in hell today. But only you would use the right material. What are you building with, believers? Jesus is our foundation. Being born again is our foundation. Sanctification, foundational to me. 
Holy Ghost is foundational to me. But what are you building there upon? You've got to be led by the Spirit in everything you do. You've got to make sure we are pursuing the things of God that we're building with the precious material in which God gave us. I don't want to build with sticks when Jesus gave me gold. I don't want to build with hay when God's given me precious stones. Because it's not secure. It does not last. There is no longevity. Why do you think there are denomination after denominations, movement after movement, when you look at them today, they're an ash heap? Because they were not able to identify the preciousness I feel the Holy Ghost here. You know what God wants every man and woman in this room to understand today? He's given you precious things to build with. He's laid a foundation and He's given you the material to build. Hallelujah. I pay rent. And I would love for somebody to came to me and come to me and say, Look, got a nice piece of property. I've laid a foundation and I'm purchasing all the material. Move in in a few months. I'd be silly to say, no, can you take that hardwood out and put laminate flooring, please? No, I don't, I don't want that. That's a nice table, but can you go to that particle board? You know, that's a little better. That's my preference. And then a few years up the road, the laminate's coming up, and the particle board's warped because I spilled a drink on it, and I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there, I had access to precious things, but I built with lesser. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand today, friend. You've got access to precious material. There's a foundation already been laid. You didn't sweat and die for it. Jesus did. The disciples helped lay it. Jesus laid the foundation. They helped continue it. You live in a free nation. You have freedom to serve Him. You have liberty to serve Him. We have have captivity. Jesus has opened the doors. Forgiveness is there. Deliverance is there. Joy and peace is there. Why not build on the foundation? You ever walk by a burnt down house and you see a chimney sitting there? But do you know they use a different mortar for chimneys than they do for regular underpinning of houses? Has a higher tolerance for heat. You know what God wants to do for every one of us? He wants to put brick by brick in each life. This church. To reach out in this community. He's trying to set brick by brick. And He's not giving us some weak material. He's giving us the best of the best. He's giving us the best mortar. He's giving us the best bricks. He's giving us the precious things to build with. And we need to make sure we are continuing in Christ. And not building with the weak things that we try to put together with our flesh. Comes a point in every life, every church, and every individual where personal opinion has to die. And you have to be led by the Spirit. I've had to overcome prejudices in my mind. Because I, if I had kept going the way I was going, I would probably be nothing but an ash heap today. Even though there was some truth in what I was believing, and some truth in some of the ways I was going. Like I said, I've shared briefly testimony. Men were telling me what to preach. There were certain things I tried to force the way I wanted to force them. I was not led by the Spirit. If I kept going that way today, I wouldn't have married the woman I would have married. I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been where I needed to be. I know I wouldn't be here today. But the Holy Ghost had to sit me down for a season. He had to take me to mourning, through fasting, through prayer, had to weep. I had to find peace. And the Holy Ghost simply showed me through all of that, Son, I've given you precious things to build with. Don't go the way of man. You go the way of the Holy Ghost no matter what anybody's opinion is, no matter what somebody's prejudice is. You build with the precious things that I've given you. I challenge you if every individual here would do that. And don't matter what your perspective personally is, if you find out what the Holy Ghost is saying, You figure out exactly what He is saying. Not what you think, but what He is saying. You would be surprised what the Holy Ghost would do in this church. The Lord's already showed me a few things since I've been here. I would pray a private prayer sitting right here. Get a phone call that afternoon. Prayer answered. It's happened three times since I've been here. And I felt the Holy Ghost just reiterate to me, I'm showing you, I'm moving. Church, He's moving. There's trying, the Holy Ghost wants there to be a a spirit of continuance in every life here. There's going to be eternal judgment. 
How are you building? As my wife comes to the piano, the basic overview of this today is this, simply this. As Second John 1 and 8 says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which He have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. A full reward. Many, many ideas about that verse of Scripture. But I take it at face value. I want the full reward. I want a full reward. I'm telling you, friends, today, thank God for the resurrection. Thank God for this foundation. But there's going to be a judgment. Watch what you say. Watch what you do. Be careful who you shove out. Be careful who you make sure everything you do is spirit led. That we can be what we need to be. As your individual life, let the Holy Ghost show you there has to be and a judgment one day. And He wants you to receive a full reward. Stand to your feet. Thank you for listening. Closing overview of the judgment is simply this. All people without exception will pass through the final judgment of God. The judgment will be according to their attitudes or actions, which are a sure sign of the genuineness or absence of faith in Christ. The fork in the road leads either to eternal life or the wrath and the fury of God. Hear me today. If you haven't chose eternal life today, if you're not saved... You need to come to Christ.